Good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's afternoon for me because I flew in from London yesterday, so I've been awake since 4 a.m. this morning. <laughs> the good news is this means I'm peaking just about now, so it's, it's good. Um, so, oh, there we go. So I'm going to talk about, uh, so my site actually started coincidentally about 14, 15 years ago, so kind of roughly the same time that PDF was getting started. And that took over two years ago. Um, after Tom, our illustrious founder, who, who's kind of uh, moved on. Um, but as I said, coming, coming from London, it's really strange to be here today rather than in London, considering there's a general election on and a really, really strange general election as well. I mean, everything that's happened over the past 12 months has kind of come to head at this moment, and I'm uh, lucky enough to be addressing you guys here. But yeah, so much has changed, obviously, uh, and not least in London, uh, just you're leaving my family behind when just like 10 days after uh, the third terrorist attack in, in the last couple of months. Um, it's pretty weird. But you know, London is strong. London, the UK is strong. And what makes it really important is we know that, that so many uh, people in this audience and the, the American people in general really have our back and reckon you are there for us. So it's always galling, of course, when perhaps your leaders uh, don't always share that same uh, feeling of camaraderie and support. So what I'm going to talk about is kind of civic technology in a time of cacistocracy. I'm really glad I was able to pronounce that word well. But cacistocracy is, is when the worst, most unscrup unscrupulous, least qualified people are in charge. Okay? <laughs> Does anyone relate to that at all? Okay. Um, and uh, so what do we do about it? So, I'm going to whip through this now. So civic technology, from my perspective, is technology for the common good. It's really there to benefit all citizens. And at my society, uh, we talk about inventing and popularizing tools that give citizens influence over those with power. Inventing and popularizing, OK? Part of the problem with civic tech at the moment is we're probably better at the inventing and less good at the popularizing. Okay. Even my society, we've been going for about 14 years. Our services are used by about 10 million people every year. And we run services with partners in about 44 countries. And this is from a relatively small team of about 25 people just based in the UK. Um, but the popularizing I'm talking about is not that we don't reach enough people in totality. We're just not reaching enough of those who could really benefit from this technology. Okay. We're not reaching people from more underrepresented groups. We're not reaching people from ethnic minorities, from poorer neighborhoods. We're not reaching the people that, frankly, have been failed by government. And so from a civic technology perspective, that isn't going to happen unless we choose to do something about it. So a couple of years ago, we did a report where we looked at who actually benefits from civic tech. And these numbers were from fixmystreet.com, which is one of our services in the UK. And 70% of the users were over the age of 45. 64% were male, 94% of the users were white. And this is across the whole of the UK. And we, we, we did a, a lot of similar studies in a lot of different countries and so on as well. But the, the headline was that we were servicing people who were frankly male, pale, and stale. <laughs> and you know, these are people like myself, I might add, who frankly are already well served, served by government. They're already comfortable picking up the phone, complaining to an elected official or a civil servant. They have an expectation that if they ask for something, it will probably get done. But these are people who, so for civic tech, what we found, especially with Fix My Street and some of the other services, we were already servicing people. It was more channel shift. They were moving from the phone to digital, but we weren't reaching enough of the new audiences. And the reality is, too many people just don't feel empowered and capable of impacting what happens in the local community. And that's a real problem, because if you don't think your voice is going to be heard, if you don't think you can change anything, if you don't think you have the tools to actually hold power to account, then you're going to lose faith in the system. And I think we've seen the, the, the end result of that. that, that this stuff has real world consequences. Brexit, Trump, Marine Le Pen in the far right in France. Yeah, these are really big issues. This is, you know, think about what, what's changed over the past 12 to 18 months. So many certainties that we held true are just kind of have fallen by the wayside. So, oh my God, did, did civic tech cause Brexit? Well, maybe not, but it hasn't done enough 
to prevent this stuff happening. Because the fact is, when if civic tech isn't able to fulfill its promise of holding power to account, people will turn to strong men and women who will give them, who they think will change the system, who will give them a voice. And so it's incumbent on us to understand, well, what role does civic tech play within this? Because it certainly can't do it itself. It's got to be part of much bigger systems. But how do we connect with partners and other people who are already doing this on the ground, but civic tech could either amplify their efforts or they could amplify the efforts of civic technology. Because civic tech at the moment is still too fragmented and too atomized. It's still too hobbyist. It's still, in a way, the, it's, it's the side project. You get a lot of people getting involved in this stuff, but it's something they do in the evenings or weekends, or maybe they have a little uh, thing that they, 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 they're, they're hacking away at. Uh, it's not taking advantage of some of the more traditional structures that already exist. Um, and you're, does the world really need half a dozen voter apps at, at election time? Does it, you know, what tends to happen is lower barrier tools get duplicated and copied because they're a really good and important way in. But it means we're not tackling enough of the big, really intractable issues that really need to be dealt with at the moment. So what do we do about it? The first thing, and I'll, I'll talk partly about, if, if I'm going to talk interchangeably about what we're doing at my society, but also what the civic tech sector can do as well. So the, the first thing, and, and certainly what I've tried to do over the past couple of years since joining my society, is to really be very clear about what we're good at and what we're not good at. Uh, and it's so important that we get beyond the not invented here problem, that you know, we won't work with tools or technology that we haven't built ourselves. Um, so a big part of what we're doing is uh, a lot of the services that we already run, we're looking at, you know, could we collaborate with other people to, to find bigger audiences or uh, reach more people or have greater impact? So, for instance, we run a service called everypolitician.org, which is gathering together um, standardised uh, and consistent data on every national politician in the world. And we've been running that pro project for about two years, and we're kind of at the limit of our ability to keep it going on our own because it's, it's now got up to about 73,000 politicians in 233 countries and 3.9 million data points. And there's a really good service that, that, uh, that collaboratively pulls all this type of data together. So we're, we're now trying to transition that project to uh, work with Wikidata and Wikipedia where it can reach a lot more people. It can draw upon a lot more uh, expertise outside of our domain, and it can hopefully be used for, for kind of uh, much greater purposes as well. So that's just a small example. Another example is we're looking to work with the Citizens, Citizens Advice Bureau, which is a, a kind of organization in the UK, which is very much at the front line of uh, helping people with real world problems and trying to better understand uh, you know, you know, what role could technology play to kind of help uh, those volunteers uh, on the ground who are helping people uh, with, with kind of multiple disadvantage. The second thing has really been less tech and more civic. You think we would get this already, but it's, it's, it's funny, it's, I think it was last year that Amidia's um, Engines of Change report was launched where it recognised that civic tech hadn't yet got to that point where it was really a movement in its own right. And more problematically, it wasn't really present in some of the big social movements that were really kind of shaping the debate over the past couple of years. And it's really essential to recognize that so much, when people, especially if you come to it from a, just a technology point of view, they think they're kind of, they, there's a lot of reinventing the wheel. So trying to recognize in academia and existing activist organizations and the corporate worlds, it, you know, there's a lot of domain knowledge, a lot of expertise that we can take advantage of. So Understanding that technology not only isn't always the answer, but being humble enough to recognize the role technology can play with other partners. Every single, so of, of the 44 countries that we operate in, every single successful uh, service has, been, has only been successful because we've, we've got a great partner on the ground, a local partner who really understands the people we're trying to serve, the particular politics and the... Uh, the, uh, the, the, the lay of the land, if you like. You know, a, a bunch of technologists based in the UK can't possibly hope to run a parliamentary monitoring site in South Africa on our own, and nor would we consider doing that. 
So we work with great partners in each country. We, we know what we're good at. We provide the tech. They provide the editorial, the understanding of the, uh, you know, how to reach journalists, you know, the type of people, the problems they have on the ground, and how they can really be helped as well. And the third thing is, is, is very much designed with and not for. You know, I think a lot of the um, civic tech uh, projects that we've been involved in over the past 10, 15 years have been you know, capable of being dealt with purely from a technology point of view. So we run a freedom of information website in the UK called whatdotheyknow.com. And it's, it's really about kind of process and workflow and making it easier for people to submit an FOI request to any of 19,000 public bodies in the UK. And we've been able to kind of roll that out all around the world. So the, there's versions of that in 28 countries currently. But the, the bigger challenge we have is in our better cities practice. And if you get a chance, Matt Jukes, who's a product manager, I think he's up the back there. Uh, Matt Jukes from my site, he's, uh, the task he's, he's got is really to work out within our better cities practice. Well, how do we really understand these frankly poorly understood user needs within these underrepresented groups? What type of services should we be building? Is it the case that we need to be um, developing entirely new services? Is it the case we need to augment what we already have to improve it? Is it a marketing problem? Is it just people just don't know about this stuff enough? Because the end result of this is, is really help and support flourishing communities. Because in, in this time when the national leadership has gone a bit crazy, your Brexit is such a horrible self-inflicted wound which is going to have impact for generations and generations. At least you guys will get rid of Trump in a couple of years, hopefully, or he'll get rid of himself. But Brexit's for life, unfortunately. Um, the flourishing community, you're yeah, actually getting people to the point where these communities are enabled and capable of uh, you're impacting their own local area. Uh, you're, they have the tools to hold local officials to account. Uh, they have the ability to have their voice heard. The, this is the kind of the end result. This is the type of uh, point we need to get to. Uh, and I know I'm kind of running out of time. So just to kind of wrap up, civic tech is only a really small part of the puzzle. It can be an incredibly important part. This is why I was so attracted to this role. This is a dream job for me to work in my society, and I really love what we're doing. But it's only a small part of it. So recognizing that when the world's gone mad, you need to kind of build those coalitions. You need to reach out to those communities who really can better represent the groups we really need to help. And ultimately, when they build walls, we need to build bridges. When they turn their back in the world, we need to hold out our hand and, and collaborate. So I'm extremely hopeful about the next few years. If, if the one thing this does is kind of really kind of sharpen the work that we do and make sure uh, we're a better place to work with other people, then hopefully that's a good outcome. So I'm, I really look forward to speaking to more of you over the next couple of days. I can now go and enjoy the conference, and I'll probably be having a nap mid-afternoon, no doubt. But thanks very much for your time.